don't know about you, but I couldn't have made it this far without the Lord. Let me take this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to all of you for every kind remembrance of me and expression of gratitude. I am grateful. And I learned from my father that people don't have to be nice, and when they are nice, they don't have to be nice to you. Thank you for being nice. I want to talk from this thought, hold on until God blesses you, or hold on until God changes you. I don't know if there's anyone here and you have prayed and prayed and it appears that God is not hearing your prayers. Certainly God has not responded in the affirmative and you have yet to get any indication that God is working on your behalf. This year, as you have already heard, is my 30th year in ministry, and I can tell you from my own experiences that if you hold on and keep holding on, God will come through. It's really true what Isaiah wrote has I not known, has I not heard, the everlasting Father, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength, even the youth will be weary, and young men will utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they'll mount up with the wings of eagles, they'll run and not get weary, they'll walk and not faint. Last time I preached from this pulpit, I don't know if you remember, I preached from the subject, blessed in a mess. We talked about Abraham and Sarah. Uh, God had promised them a child. Now they had become old and the child had not yet come. Abraham was 85 years old and Sarah was about 75. They decided to take matters into their own hand and Sarah instructed Abraham to take Hagar, her servant, as a servicate. The two of them had a child, Ishmael. However, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son a man that he should repent. If God makes a promise, God will keep his word. And when Abraham was 99 years old, he sighed Isaac with Sarah, who was 89. The promised child was born. Now Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, marries Rebekah. They have two sons, Esau and Jacob. This brings me to text where our lesson is found today. Let's take a look at the story. Now um, Abraham now had died and Isaac, his son, was old and his eyes were weak so that he could not see, called his elder son Esau and said to him, my old man now, and go out and hunt some game for me and make me some tasty soup. Bring it to me so that I may bless you before I die. Now Rebecca, who favored Jacob over Esau, and she really wanted Jacob to have the blessing, so she called Jacob and told Jacob to go and get two goats and that she would prepare the food just like Isaac would. I mean, just like Isaac likes it. And Jacob said, in essence, Mom, you know that Esau has hairy skin, does not smell like me. Surely Father will know that it's not me, and I will be cursed. And her mother said, his mother said, just do as I said. I want to suggest that many times our children learn how to lie, how to be manipulative from us. We tell them to tell the creditor that I'm not at home. Sometimes we will pit one child over the other. I'll do something special for you, just don't tell your brother or your sisters. We do the same thing in our clubs and in the choirs. We have meetings and sessions with certain people while excluding those 
who might even be more qualified, but just because somebody else is our favorite. Well, let me move on with the story. Rebecca makes the soup. She dresses Jacob in Esau's clothing, places goat skin on the smooth part of his body, because Jacob's body was probably like mine, was smooth, not hairy. He probably played games like backgammon and chess. Esau probably played basketball and soccer. soccer. He was a rugged guy. And when Jacob approaches his father with the mill, Isaac says, you sound like Jacob. Come and let me feel your skin. Oh, you feel like Esau. You must be Esau. How did you prepare the food so quickly? Jacob lies and says, the Lord was kind and gave me success. So Isaac blessed Jacob. Later, Esau comes in with special soup for his father. Father, here I am with the meal that you requested. Isaac begins to tremble. My son, you and I have been deceived. Your brother came in as an imposter. I blessed him, and you will now have to serve him. And Esau says, Father, you don't have a blessing for me. But I want to suggest to you that whatever God has for you, it is for you. Nobody can take the blessing that God has for you, even if there's some folk that are manipulative and conniving. And Esau decided that when the days of mourning were over, after his father Isaac died, that he was certainly going to kill Jacob. Now again, you know how your moms are to have these special children that you love so much. She came to the assistant of her favorite son, Jacob. When she learned that Esau was going to kill Jacob, she told Jacob to flee to her brother Laban's home. She told them that when things died down a bit, as soon as Esau calmed down, she would send for him. I want to suggest that if you really want to be blessed, even when you mess up, you got to learn how to pray. That God answers prayer. Anybody know that God answers prayer? And so Jacob left and was going now to Haran. And it was dangerous. They didn't have roads like we have here. There was no I highway I-95 and I-90. Uh, there was not even a smooth street like the paved Ocean Parkway now. It was rough and rugged, and as he was running and trying to get to his uncle Laban's house, um, he became exhausted. And he stopped, and he realized that he couldn't make it without prayer. First of all, when you know you've messed up already, when you've already lied and connived and been manipulative, and now you're on the run, and there's nobody to help you, the only one that you can turn to is God. And I'm so glad that the God we serve does not deal with us according to our sins and according to our misdeeds, but the God that we serve will look beyond our faults and seize our needs. And the Bible says that Jacob took a stone for a pillow. He must have prayed. He must have fallen asleep. He must have kept on praying. If you ever really get in trouble, see, this congregation looked like none of you have ever been in trouble. But if you've ever been in trouble and had trouble coming after you and there was nowhere to turn, you will pray all day and all night. And the Bible says that he prayed and he prayed and he went to sleep. But if you wait on the Lord and you look to him, he'll show up. And the Bible says that he saw a ladder going from earth 
to heaven, he saw angels ascending and descending on this ladder. This is where we get the song. We're climbing Jacob's ladder. And every round goes higher and higher. And if you pray right, God will renew your strength. And against this backdrop, once he got strength from the Lord, he continued his journey. And now when he gets to Laban's house and Laban sees his nephew, he runs and kisses him. Now Laban had two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And um, when Jacob sees Rachel, she's fine. She's like Beyonce. She's good looking. He falls in love with her immediately. And he says, his uncle says to him, um, because you are my nephew, you ought not work for free for me. So I'll pay you. What would you want? Well, Rachel was so fine, Rogier. He said, well, I work for seven years if you give me Rachel for my wife. It's in the Bible, around 28, 29th chapter of Genesis. That's why I like reading the Bible, you know, because it, it, it's even better than some of the soap operas that you've watched on TV. You thought when you saw As the World's Turn, you, you thought when you were watching Scandal or Empire, that they had nothing going on over God's word. And so after seven years of working, and the Bible says that he was so anxious and he was so excited about Rachel that the time went by so fast that he didn't even know the seven years had passed. But when the seven years passed, he said to his uncle Laman, now give me Rachel as you promised for my wife. Now, some of you don't even understand why we wear a veil when, you get, when the bride wears a veil when she gets married, and why the groom is not supposed to see the bride until after the marriage, and they only connect during the time of the consummation. And so, Jacob thinks that he has Rachel, but when he wakes up, because they had a lot of partying during these times and weddings, like you all do, we were in a wedding in St. Martin. I had to leave early, but some folk who stayed later had a good time. That's not part of the sermon. But when he came to, after whatever he had done on his wedding night, Justin, he woke up and realized he had Leah. Now, Leah wasn't good looking. She was cockeyed. Face wasn't too straight. He was upset. He went to his uncle and said to his uncle, why would you do this to me? You promised me, Rachel. The uncle says, well, you got to understand that the eldest daughter have to get married first. So if you work another seven years, you can get Rachel. But he was so in love that he worked another seven years so that he could get Rachel. Now, you need to understand that what goes around comes around. Because his uncle was also a trickster. So now he had worked 14 years. And his uncle still would not let him go. So now he has to work another six years in order to get the oxen and the resources that he would need to take his family. And then after working another six years, 14 plus six, how much is that? That was 20 years. The uncle still didn't want to let him go. But he decided now 
that he had already paid the price and that he was going to take his family. Now he had two wives. Um, Leah had had a number of children for him and he had his oxen and his donkeys and he decided that he was going to leave and go back home as God had commanded him. But he was afraid to go home because now you must remember that Esau was going to come to kill him. So he wasn't sure exactly what to do, but he decided to leave with his family. But when you learn how to pray, God will make a way for you out of no way. And even when it gets dark, you need to trust God. And so read the text. He leaves to go back home, and his uncle, Laman, comes after him to kill him. But because he knew how to pray, because he tried to do the right thing in spite of the things he had done wrong previously, he called on the Lord, and the Lord will show up. He may not come when you want him, but he'll come up and show up on time. And God spoke to Laman and said, do not harm Jacob. And so when Laman got to where Jacob was, God would not allow him to cause any harm to come to Jacob. Because what God has for you is for you. And God can protect you in the midst of trouble. Preach, James. And so when they got to the place, is where we get the mispa. God spoke to both of them, and they had this prayer. May the Lord watch between me and thee when we're absent, one from another, and they each departed and went their own way. I'm just trying to tell you that what I've learned these 30 years is that prayer works. Don't listen to people. Don't listen to the political report. Don't listen to gossip but learn to trust in God, learn to hold on to his unchanging hands, and when God gets ready, God will show up and God will show out, because whatever God has for you is for you. When I was in ministry in this church and had now been ordained and called to the ministry and even ordained and elected to become the next pastor of this church, that time did not come. In 1999, I was ordained. Well, I had already been ordained. I was ordained in 1988. But I was elected the co pastor in 1999. Some folk were excited and some folk weren't. But I thought certainly in the year 2000, Pastor would step down. He was already in his 80s. 2001, 2002. Some folks said, well, you just need to leave that church. I even talked to my professors at the university. And they said, if I were you, I would not stay. But I had not been released by God. There was something within that holds the rain. Something within, I cannot explain. All I know is that there was something within. And it wasn't until the year 2006, totally unexpected, that my dad announced his retirement and I became the sixth pastor of the Salem Missionary Baptist Church. Because whatever God has for you, it is for you. And if you learn how to pray, and if we learn to trust God, and if we learn to wait on him, he'll show up in his own time. Now let's get back to the story. Jacob is still concerned because Esau is threatening to kill him. And I want to suggest that when you realize the awesomeness of God, when it begins to change you, God will humble you. You can't do wrong and think that you can get by without showing 
humility and remorsefulness for that that you've done wrong. There are those that say, I told it to Jesus. The Bible says that if you have all in your heart against your brothers and your sisters, and you have a gift for the Lord, that you need to leave your gift at the altar and go back and make peace with your brothers and sisters. For how can you say you love God, whom you've never seen, and hate your brothers and sisters whom you see every day? There's still some folk in the church that needs to make peace with their brothers and sisters in the church, and then when you talk to God, God will hear your prayer because God has said that I will not dwell in any unclean temple. We don't preach like that anymore, but somebody needs to tell you that your heart has to be right with God. Wash in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lonely, right in the sight of God. There's still too many folk in their own family that have discrepancies with the brothers and sisters. You need to get it right so that you can talk to God and God will work it out. And so Jacob realizes that he owes his brother some kind of explanation, that he needs to be repentant. He needs to humble himself before his brother because he has been conniving. He has been manipulative. He has taken that that did not belong to him. And so the Bible says he sends messengers with gifts to Esau. And he says, to, he says to them to say to Esau, your servant Jacob has asked us to bring these gifts of reconciliation. And then the messengers return to Jacob saying, your brother is coming to see you. And there are about 400 with them. Where Jacob becomes really afraid and he prays and he says, Lord, I am unworthy, but at your hand I'm returning home. Save me, I pray you, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid that he will come and attack me. But you have said that you would be with me. You have said that you would prosper me. You have said that you will protect me. And every now and then you can talk to God about what God has promised because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. And the Bible says that Jacob sends his family ahead, and he sends livestock, and he sends his servants ahead. He sends two groups ahead, and now he is left alone. He knows that he's got to spend some time with God before he can confront his brother Esau. I want to suggest that if you've got a mountain you cannot climb, if you've got a river that you cannot cross, if you've got a problem that's too big for you, then you need to spend some time with God alone. Sometimes you've got to go to the garden alone to pray while the dew is still on the roses and God will come to you, and the voice that you hear falling on your ear, it'll be the Son of God discloses. Sometimes I can tell you, in these 30 years, I've had to talk to God all by myself. I had to tell him all about my trouble. I had to tell him, Lord, I know that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you're able to ask or think. God, I read in your word that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to your purpose. God, I read in your word that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. I dare you to spend some time with God alone and God will send help to the sanctuary. Here it is. The Bible says that Jacob was left alone and when he's left alone that God showed up, that a man wrestled with Jacob to daybreak. Don't get weary when the going gets tough. Don't get weary when things get rough. 
Don't get weary when everything doesn't go your way. I tell you, by the fire of God's word, just continue to hold on to God's unchanging hands. The Bible says that God, that Jacob wrestled with this man. And, and the man said to Jacob, let me go. It has to be a wrestle and a tussle. This antagonist that he could not see, that he could not recognize, but he realized that he was in the presence of something that was bigger than he was. I dare you to get yourself in the presence of God and allow God to speak to you, allow God to handle you, allow God to break you down. We sing this song, but we really don't believe it. We sing, a spirit of the living God, fall upon me. We need you to make Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me to your glory. You want God to break you down so that he can build you up. Some of us are too arrogant so that God can't do anything with us. I dare you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and the God who created you, the God who breathed in you, the breath of life will work it out. I don't know about you, but my prayer is that I'm going to hold on until God blesses me. I'm going to preach until he blesses me. I'm going to pray until he blesses me. I'm going to serve until he blesses me. I'm going to teach until he blesses me. If I was a choir member, I would say I'm going to sing in the choir until he blesses me. I'm going to usher until he blesses me. I'm going to deacon until he blesses me. Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me because the God we serve is able. Who did Jacob meet? I'm almost done. Jacob met the pre-incarnate Christ. He met the lamb that was slain even from the foundation of the world. He met the one that is the alpha and the omega. He met the lily of the valley. He met the bright and morning star. He met the offspring of David. He met my bridge over troubled water. He met my prayer book and my daddy's walking cane. He met the one that is God all by himself. And I tell you, if you ever meet Jesus, he will change you. If you ever meet Jesus, he will transform you. I talked to some folk that met him. I talked to the apostle Paul, who was Saul, said, I met him on the Damascus Road. I was on my way to stuff out and kill some Christians, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I said, who are you? I said, I am the Lord whom you are persecuting. He turned me around, and I became a great apostle from of the church. Three thirds of the New Testament are written by the Apostle Paul because if he ever meets you, he'll change you. There was Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He was up in a sycamore tree. He had robbed so many people, overcharged them for taxes, but he heard that Jesus was passing by. I dare you to get to where you can see Jesus. And when Jesus passed by, he knew that he was looking for Jesus. Jesus called them down from the sycamore tree and said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to have dinner at your house tonight. The woman at the well who had been with five men, Jesus told her, and the one you're with is not your husband. She didn't get mad with Jesus. She said, you must be a prophet. He says, she says, I'm looking for the Messiah. And Jesus said, well, give me something to drink. She said, but I have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Jesus said, but if you knew who it was, that asked you for something to drink, you would ask me for water, and I would have given you that water that dwells up into everlasting life. She says, you must be the Messiah. Jesus says, I am he. She left and became uh, an evangelist for Jesus the Christ. She went back to all the men that she had been with before, to everybody in the village. And she said, the way I used to walk, I don't walk no more. The way I used to talk, I don't talk anymore. It's been a great change since I've been born. Our old fathers and mothers put it this way. When they met the Lord, they said, I looked at my hands. My hands look new. I looked at my feet. They did too. It's a great change since I've been born. And the Bible says that when he got to Esau, 
Esau was so glad to see him that he ran and put his arms around his neck. And he saw Esau and he thought he was looking at the face of God and all the gifts that he wanted to give Esau. Esau says, I don't need your gifts. I'm not even trying to kill you. God has blessed me. I don't need what you have because whatever God has for you is for you. And the Bible says that God blessed Jacob and Jacob's name was changed. His name was Jacob, but he changed his name. Jacob means trickster, manipulator, conniving, but God changed his name to Israel because he had seen God face to face. I don't know what your problem is, but I want you to know that the God I serve is able to change your name. If your name this morning is despair, God can change your name to hope. If your name this morning is sadness, God can change it to joy. If your name this morning is sickness, God can change it to wellness because he's still got more healing in the hem of his garment than all the hospitals in all the world. I'm not even worried about death because I heard Paul declare in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality then shall be brought the past the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your sting oh grave where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ I tell you I'd rather have Jesus than houses and land. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world can afford because he's joy in the midst of sadness. He's hope in the midst of despair. He's a way out of no way. He is the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's God all by himself and he's worthy. I said he's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. I tell you I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power. It is the dunamis to everyone that will believe. And so I offer you Jesus whole to God unchanging hands. Don't give up. Keep on praying. Keep on pushing. Pray until something happens. God will show up. He will show out because he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you're able to ask or think. He's able to do anything but fail. Give him praise, honor, and glory.